So a few months ago, I was contacted by a rep from Anet and I was asked if I wanted to do a video review on one of their 3D printers. And of course I accepted it because who wouldn't want a free 3D printer? And they sent me the ET5X. What I thought was nice was that they didn't try and steer me in any one particular direction. They just sort of sent me the printer and said, have at it. And all they wanted in return was a video. So I just wanted to get that out of the way and let you guys know that I did get this printer for free. And so I've seen a few other reviews of these printers online. And in my opinion, those guys didn't really extensively review the printer. You know, they print a few small items and they tell you about how great the printer is, but they didn't really live with it for any extended period of time. And so in my case, I tried to do that. I tried to make this my primary printer for a few months, which I did. So I've had this printer now for a few months because I want to bring you guys an honest review and I want to let you know what it's like over an extended period of time. And so in this video, we're gonna be focusing on some of the things that really matter most to me and the things that I really don't care about, we're not gonna spend too much time on. So let's get started. Unboxing the printer, it looks like it was pretty carefully and thoughtfully packaged, so that was good. The printer comes with a decent little toolkit, which is great if this is your first printer. The side cutters and scraper actually seem like decent quality items despite the price of the printer being so low. And you even get a roll of PLA, which is really pretty good quality to get you started. Awesome. Before assembling any printer, I typically like to take a peek inside where the electronics live. I usually don't leave my printers completely unattended while printing, and I don't blindly trust the wiring practices of cheap 3D printers. They often come with certifications that are likely falsified. Inside of the ET5X, it doesn't look too bad, but you will notice that the metal frame is not grounded and the power supply is some off-brand. I would have gladly paid for a genuine Meanwell power supply, which I believe can be found on the ET5X Pro version, but... This will be an upgrade for me in the future. Some grommets around the wiring exiting the metal enclosure would have been really nice as well. So keep an eye on abrasion in these areas to prevent future shorts or add your own grommets for peace of mind. Next, the assembly is pretty straightforward, but the instructions are lacking a little bit. However, if you've ever bought a 3D printer in the past, you're probably not new when it comes to building these things, so you'll figure it out. My only suggestion here is to take your time and make sure that all of your axes are perpendicular to one another when you tighten your bolts down. A speed square is handy for this and it'll prevent you from scratching your head later on if you get weird printing results. Since this is a dual Z-Rod printer, make sure your X gantry is aligned on the Z-Rods and not binding. Also be sure that your rubber wheels aren't binding and your X and Y axis can move freely. There shouldn't be any play, but it shouldn't be so tight that it feels like it's getting stuck. There are eccentric adjustable wheels that you can find here, 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 that can be adjusted with the included wrench. Also, double check your hot end. Mine came with a nozzle and heat brake that was misaligned, but it was easily fixed by backing off the two screws at the bottom and then carefully retightening them while ensuring the nozzle and heat brake were straight. Now the whole printer assembled smoothly for me, but I did find that my LCD screen was faulty due to a torn flexible PCB connector from the factory. In this case, I went ahead and operated my printer over USB through Repetier Host, and I was able to get everything set up. My slicer of choice is PE Slicer, but I couldn't seem to find any profiles for the ET5X online, so I made my own profile. I based it off some of the Creality templates since these machines share so many similarities. This worked out nicely, and I only had to make some minor changes to the profile to get some really nice prints in a short period of time. Check out the video description down below for a link to the PE Slicer profile files for the ET5X. And so my printing experience was not without some challenges and my first few prints showed some signs of under extrusion. And typically when I run into under extrusion, I start to look for resistance in the filament path. In my experience, this is usually the culprit. Since the ET5X uses a Bowden tube, this can sometimes be a source of additional friction. And I found that tying the Bowden tube to the hot end wiring harness too tightly creates too sharp of a bend in the tube. This is the setup that I found works best for me, so don't over constrain your Bowden tube. Also, be aware of the depth that your tube gets inserted into your hot end. It is imperative that you, your tube is fully seated in the hot end to prevent hot end jams. I experienced one within the first few prints and I had to disassemble the hot end, clean it out and reassemble it. Probably because this is something I failed to check from the start and I'd be willing to bet this contributed to my under extrusion problems as well. After that, 95% of the under extrusion problems were gone and the remaining 5% I would blame on the design of the Bowden tube exit and entry points. As the X axis travels back and forth on this printer, it pinches the tube and creates a tight radius bend. It becomes evident in prints where the hot end travels back and forth along the X axis rapidly and under extrusion artifacts are present here. 
Without modifying the printer and moving the extruder bracket, it would be tough to get rid of this completely. And so here you can see I've printed three sets of identical parts. The pink set was done on a moderately modified printer, and the two orange sets were done on the ET5X. The one that you're looking at right now has this short side oriented with the x-axis and you can see that little bit of under extrusion on the x-axis that I just talked about that I think is due to the Bowden tube pinching and on the long side on these parts that we're looking at everything appears to be fine and it also shows that in this bridging section the printer does a decent job with bridging. Quickly looking at the pink parts, I'm sort of using these as a control because the printer that these came off of has a direct drive extruder, which is a Titan Arrow. And the printer overall is slightly modified, but it does print really nice prints overall. And you can see that they come out solid with no under extrusion. The next set of orange parts was again the ET5X, this time with the long edge oriented on the X axis. And so you can see some evidence of under extrusion in this top section here where the print head would have to move back and forth over the x-axis. Now, what I do find kind of interesting here is that it doesn't show up so much in the longer sections, but just in the shorter sections where the print head would be oscillating back and forth in a very short area and over a short period of time, which again leads me to believe it's that pinching action happening on the Bowden tube. To test my theory, I loaded up an even longer part and put the long edge along the x-axis. Now, although the print head here does pass through a section in the middle there where the Bowden tube does get pinched, you don't see the evidence of under extrusion in the same way that you would see it on a shorter part. And so it goes back again to my theory, which I think is correct, where in these shorter sections, the print head gets stuck in this area where it's going back and forth uh, over a very short distance and the friction sort of builds up in that Bowden tube and you get that under extrusion in the parts. In contrast, a longer part turns out just fine. And you can see here that the long edge looks great. It's actually really impressive how well it turned out on this printer. I did not expect print results of this kind for a printer this cheap. And this is at a layer height of about 0.25 millimeters. So it's not even at its finest resolution. And here's another clip here where you can see under a better light the difference between the orange part and the pink part, the pink part again being my control parts on a modified printer. And the orange part turns out just fine from the ET5X and I would say it's very comparable to the parts coming off of a direct drive extruder on a much more expensive printer. Even all the small details in the lettering and numbering on these parts turned out great. Again, I was shocked with how well it did turn out. You can see actually on the top layers, one thing I'm noticing right now is that the uh, top infill looks to be a little bit thin on the ET5X. So maybe in my settings, I could bump that up a little bit as some of the infill is showing through those top layers. But otherwise, uh, it's nothing that can't be remedied with a few different uh, settings changes in the slicer. But the prints turned out fantastic and I'm really, really happy with this printer so far. For this video, I told myself I would not upgrade the printer in any way so that I could give an honest review of the printer as is out of the box. However, I will be honest, I couldn't help myself and had to make three very small changes that I think are easy enough for anyone to do and it'll really help make the printer run more smoothly and make filament changes easier. First was the addition of the Bowden motor knob, so you can push and pull filament through your Bowden tube manually. You just need to disable the motors in whatever software you're using, and this makes filament changes quick and easy by hand. The second little upgrade was printing some kind of bushing for the spools. The spool holder that comes with the machine is a small tube, and this requires the extruder motor to pull harder than it should have to in order to turn over the spool. The bushings make this movement smoother with less friction. The third thing is a small filament guide before the filament enters the runout sensor. The overhead position of the spool and the entry point for the filament means that it has to make a sharp turn into the runout sensor. The guide I designed installs by removing the spacer under the runout sensor and reusing the sensor's hardware to fasten it down. It consists of a bolt, a nut, some washers, a nylon spacer, and a 3D printed groove wheel. It works really well. All of these parts can be found in the Thingiverse link in the video description if you want them for your own printer. Now that I had that sorted out, I went about printing many rolls of PLA with great results. And although this is an inexpensive printer, it churns out some really great quality parts with decent tolerances. 
I found that the hot ends volumetric output is the limiting factor on the printer's speed and I didn't go past 0.25 millimeter layer height and no more than about 60 millimeters per second as a general rule of thumb. It's not going to break any printer speed records but the quality was consistent and I saw very little evidence of ghosting or any other imperfections on my prints and even at a 0.2 millimeter layer height with a properly leveled bed the layers were barely noticeable. I've never really been a believer in the v-shaped wheels on these types of machines but up until this point they're doing a great job. After several months of printing some wear on the wheels is becoming evident but the print quality has still been solid. Another general design rule I used for my parts for this printer was 0.5 millimeter gaps on parts that were meant to slot together. Again, this is not going to set accuracy records, but that is a pretty acceptable value in my opinion, and I print a lot of the same parts repeatedly, so there has been no change in the fitment between parts since I started printing them a few months ago. Over time, one annoying issue reared its ugly head with this printer, and it is the Z homing. I've always been a fan of good old limit switches and a manually leveled bed, Call me old fashioned, but I just don't like BL Touch, touchless sensors, and auto bed leveling features. I find that they are usually a band aid for a lazy setup or poor quality parts. Out of the box, the capacitive touchless Z probe on the ET5X worked flawlessly, and it actually had me warming up to the idea of these kinds of sensors. Each time I started the print, the hot end would home itself flawlessly, and I would get a very consistent first layer, but over time that changed. At some point, I switched over to using OctoPrint so I could free up my laptop while printing. And shortly after that, I started having probe issues. I think the change over to Octoprint around the same time is just a coincidence and not the cause of any of my problems, but I'm mentioning it just in case anyone thinks that it could somehow contribute and you can put your explanation down in the comment section below. I would love to hear it. Basically, I started having an issue where the hot end would crash into the bed and the probe would not pick up the bed. I went through the process of adjusting the sensitivity of the sensor and calibrating it, but it would still happen. Eventually, I would get the hot end crash nine times out of 10 on the first print after turning the machine on, and no amount of adjustment would get it to work, and I would have to turn the printer back off and on again and start all over. Very annoying. Other than that one issue, I'm happy to report that I have not had any other problems with this machine, and I've gone through many rolls of filament with great results. So this brings me to a quick pros and cons list that might help you decide whether or not this printer is for you. And so I'll start with the cons and finish with the pros. Number one, loud. I cannot explain to you how loud this machine is. I think by now silent stepper drivers should be standard on even the cheap Chinese machines, but for some reason the ET5X still uses terribly loud ones. If noise is going to be an issue for you, consider the ET5X Pro where they advertise silent drivers. Number two is the power supply. For the last few months, I have not stepped too far away from my printer while it's running because of the off-brand power supply and some of the wiring that lacks proper grommets and guides. The ET5X Pro from Anet apparently uses a genuine meanwhile supply. So again, the Pro version is probably a worthwhile upgrade if this is important to you. Number three is quality control. Overall, I think the machine has a lot of potential for an entry-level printer, but I think Anet needs to step up a bit with the quality control. They sent me this printer for review and I was sent a faulty LCD screen out of the box. You would think that if you were a business who was asking for someone to do a public review, you would at least ensure the printer you sent to be reviewed was in good working order before putting it in the reviewer's hands. Either this is them being too honest or just lacking quality control, I'm not really sure. Now on to the pros of this machine. Number one is the price. For all of the features you get and the large print volume, you really can't complain too much. Mechanically, the printer seems solid and the sheet metal enclosure on the bottom nicely tucks away most of the electronics. You'd be hard pressed to find another machine on the market with dual Z rods, this build size, filament runout detection, power outage recovery, auto bed leveling, heated bed, touch screen, etc. at this price point. Number two, it's very upgradable. Since this machine is basically a variant of the generic cheap Chinese machines offered by other manufacturers, you can find tons of upgrades online that are compatible with this machine. In future videos, I'm going to convert this machine over to Duet Wi-Fi control and a direct drive extruder, among other things. Number three is the build volume, and this sort of ties back into number one, at the price. You're really not gonna find a 300 by 300 by 400 millimeter tall build volume at this price point anywhere else and the heated bed at that bed size heats up very quickly so it's great you really don't have to wait very long for it to heat up and the build plate that i received was very flat i didn't really notice any warping 
or bulges in the center or anything like that when the build plate heated up. So it seems to be a very good quality build plate. So I think the big question is, who would I recommend this printer for? Now, I think if you're the type of person who really doesn't mind getting their hands dirty at the exchange of saving a little bit of money, this printer could be for you. If you're the type of person who wants to just buy something, set it up, press go, and you're done with it and not have to tinker with anything, then this may not be for you. Printers at this price point often have a trade-off between the quality and the price. And this is where, like I was saying in some of my earlier comments, you know, if you're looking for something out of the box that just works or something higher quality out of the box, you might want to consider the ET5 Pro version where you get the silent steppers and you get the better power supply inside amongst probably some other features. Now, this kind of brings me to my next point though, where, you know, if you are uh, someone who likes to get their hands a little bit dirty and you do want a cheap printer as a good starting point for your you know, custom 3D printer, I think this is a great starting point as it is a very large build volume and a very solid mechanical base. And from there, you can start addressing some of the weak points. Like I said uh, earlier in the video where I think that maybe the controller is something that I would consider upgrading in the future. And for me, this is the type of person that I am. I like upgrading things, I like customizing things. And so this is a great printer for me where I'm gonna be taking a Duet Wi-Fi controller and I'm gonna be putting it in here. I'm gonna be taking an upgraded meanwhile power supply and putting in here and addressing things like the hot end, which I think is the next weak point. And so for under $300, you get the solid mechanical base to start with. And for, you know, depending on what upgrades you go with, you know, for let's say another $200, you could get yourself a really, really solid printer all in total for under $500 with a little bit of elbow grease that you're gonna to have to put in. If you guys are interested in following along with this custom build, definitely consider subscribing to my channel because in future videos, I will of course be covering those upgrades and I always make the custom files available for free and you always find the link to my Thingiverse page where I put all these design files in the video description down below. So big thank you to Anet for sending me this free printer and this awesome base to start with for a new custom 3D printer that I will be putting together and I hope to see you guys in another video.